Okay, Danny? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. A very good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone. I'm privileged and honored to welcome this August gathering for this international webinar on peace, global peace, stability, and sustainability. On behalf of Rotary International District 3240, as the chairman of District Peace Committee, I extend a very warm welcome to all. We are honored to have amidst us a number of distinguished guests, a galaxy of peace fellows. A special welcome to all. We have our guest, Rotarian guest from across the globe. I extend a very warm welcome to all, especially from District 3350 and from Bangkok. Then we have David Hilton, PDG from District 3080. And I think we also have DG Dolly from District 3310 and from all of our other districts. A very special welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor Noni Gopal Mahanta, sir. Sir, thank you so much for sparing your valuable time and making it to this webinar. We are honored. A special welcome to all our guest peace fellows, Mr. Mm. Luis I from India, Monica Fennell from USA, Mr. Omar Given from Switzerland, Mr. Dixon Igwe from Nigeria. A very warm welcome to Inner uh, RI District 3240 and to this international webinar on peace. I also extend a warm welcome to all our other Rotarians, Innerville members, guests, invitees who are present today. Welcome everyone. We start the program with the national anthem of India. Host, can we have the national anthem? Yeah, just a moment. Jana gana mana athina yak jaya hai Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab sindh gujarat maratha Dravida kalabanga Vindya himachal yamuna ganga Chala chala di taranga, tap shup na me jagi, tap shup aashish mangi, kahi tap jaya katha, chala chala mangala daayak jaya hai. Our Honorable District Governor of RI District 3240, Rotarian Dr. M. Kaur, due to some unavoidable and unforeseen circumstances, could not make it to this webinar. However, he is sending his warm welcome to all the delegates and our speakers of this evening, and he's wishing a best wishes for successful success of this webinar. I now request our past District Governor, Rotarian Manas Choudhury, to kindly open the, declare the webinar open and give a welcome note. Uh, thank you, Bhuvali. It's my rare privilege to stand in for our respected uh, governor, uh, Dr. Shmohan Shamkor. Uh, as you mentioned, he couldn't be present and uh, I'm, privileged to stand on his behalf. 
it's a great pleasure really to uh, have all of you in our meets district 3240 has been a vanguard when it comes to peace and uh, uh, conflict resolution and we have uh, perhaps in the whole world mm -hmm. rotary world 3240 has sent the largest number of peace callers from this part of the world uh this seminar is a testimony to rotary's commitment to world peace and understanding uh, i feel uh, uh, i'm ex uh, very proud to be part of this organization uh, which has uh, peace and world understanding as one of the core uh, objective of the organization rotary international believes in a better world order peace and and a an, uh, conflict free world but that's easier said than done but rotary has lived up to its uh, commitment and it would be uh, worthwhile to just recall three initiatives that rotary has taken in this direction to my mind these are uh, really path breaking the one was when the world war 2 had ended and the world was ravaged ravaged by the bombings and uh, the death of millions of soldiers and common people the economy was shattered and the world didn't know which way to turn and that is when rotary international came forward to take the initiative of creating a new world order the initiative of rotary resulted in the formation of the united nations on the 10th of august 1945 uh as it as, as a testimony to rotary's contribution to world peace the united nation has many of the rotarians as uh, members of various bodies under the un the second initiative the rotary took was the people to people contact a phrase that's uh, basically being used now by diplomats and people who work for peace in the world people to people contact i this was uh, coined and practiced by rotary uh, through its uh, uh, path breaking program called group study exchange since 1965 uh, thousands of young business and professional people were taken under rotary's uh, guidance and expenditure borne by rotary to give them an exposure to a new environment a new country a new community a new milieu and for 30 days they would study uh, the local ethos and mix with them and learn the the local culture and uh, everything else that they could acquire and also in the process uh, create awareness about their own countries this went on for over 50 years and millions of dollars rotary spent to bring people to people contact uh, Uh, you know across the globe it uh, had to be suspended i uh, realized that when the internet overtook the world the this purpose of people to people contact uh, became a less relevant and rotary rightly suspended that but it still remains as a part of history that rotary was pioneer in starting this people to people contact the third initiative and which we are uh, witnessing here today the by product of that initiative is rotary's resolve at conflict resolution through sending uh, professionals uh, for a training in various world universities to become peace scholars and practitioners of peace and opinion makers in the community towards achieving peace this i uh, have to say that yes it's a small beginning we are yet to make uh, that much of impact but it's a matter of time when the peacemakers as we have gathered here today we can see people from nigeria from us and uh, switzerland they are here well, the purpose is to think alike and work alike this seminar is an effort towards the, uh, in that direction and i'm sure this is going to be uh giving us a little direction a small few steps if we can take as rotarians and non rotarians the like to reduce 
the areas of conflict, I think our purpose will be served more than <laughs> adequately. I extend uh, on behalf of the district governor, I welcome a special welcome to Professor Noni Gopal Mohanta, an opinion maker in his own right, a scholar, a social activist, uh, all over and around him. He is uh, a luminary in the field of uh, peace and conflict resolution. Welcome uh, to this uh, program, and we are uh, will be uh, awaiting your weighty uh, disposition. I welcome uh, Mr. Omer Govin from Switzerland. Uh, nice to have you over. We have also a uh, peace caller, Monica Fennell from USA. Uh, welcome, Monica. Uh, we have our own Luis Ainad from India, and also Dr. Dixon Igwe from Nigeria. Warm welcome to 3 to 4 zero. This is a seminar that uh, you will dominate, we will listen, and uh, uh, we will become wiser by your disposition. Once again, let me welcome all the other guests, our past governors, our Rotarians, and, uh, uh, and I hereby I declare the global peace, stability, and sustainability open. Thank you. Please unmute. Kubali Bai, you are next. Yes. Thank you, PDG Rotary Manasda. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, on this International Day of Peace, I am extremely pleased to welcome all of you, and in particular, our participating speakers from across the globe and all our distinguished guests from India and abroad. I'm immensely honored to speak on the purpose of this webinar on world peace. Peace is a cornerstone of Rotary's mission, complementing Rotary's quest for humanitarian service. Rotarians believe in acting local and thinking global, and that ensuring peaceful communities can have a compounding effect globally, enabling tolerance, compassion, empathy, and lasting peace. Rotary is working on the forefront of addressing the underlying causes of conflict in communities and countries around the world. This commitment of Rotary can be traced back to 1914 when, as a young organization, Rotary International publicly announced, I quote, Rotarians proposes to land its influence to the maintenance of peace among nations of the world. That was quite a bold statement made by a very young international organization. Even the founder of Paul Rotary, Paul Harris, in his message to the 1921 Rotary Convention had written, Rotary believes that the better the people of one nation understand the people of other nation, the less the likelihood of friction, and Rotary will therefore encourage acquaintance and friendship between individuals of different nations, and thus, at the 1921 RI Convention, the constitution of Rotary was amended to bring the, include the goal to aid in the advancement of international peace and goodwill as one of the focus area of Rotary. As already mentioned by PDZ Manasta, Rotary members worked relentlessly during and after the World War II, facilitating international understanding and constructing the building blocks for dialogue and humanitarian aid to war-torn societies. Long before there was United Nations, even before human rights was the term most people even understood, Rotarians meeting in Havana adopted the resolution calling for freedom, justice, truth of the pledged word, and respect for human rights. Rotarians, yes, also played a pivotal forming of the United Nations and served in the United Nations Charter Conference. The United Nations and Rotary form an invaluable partnership of achieving the common objective of saving lives. As already stated, already mentioned, Rotary's Peace Fellowship Program 
supports experienced professionals as leaders and catalysts for peace and conflict resolutions in their chosen field. These international network of leaders are creating paradigm shift in the way the world interacts with and understand peace. Peace fellows work to address today's most pressing global issues, including in the six areas of focus of Rotary. The impact that Rotary's global network have on peace is indeed tremendous. Ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of this webinar is to take an insight into the impact that Rotary has made so far, as Rotary remains committed to creating lasting change that enhances international relationship and create a peaceful world, it is necessary that we take an insight to the impact that Rotary has been able to make so far, both in local communities and globally towards peace and conflict resolution, and to deliberate upon on the changes needed, measures to be adopted in keeping with the ever-changing demands and challenges in the society towards achieving global peace, stability, and sustainability. The aim of this webinar is also to enjoy the dividend from the investment made on the peace scholars, sharing the initiatives and activities of Rotary Peace Fellows from across the globe can be of great help in Rotary's future course of action towards its goal of international peace and understanding, learn about investing in the factors that build peace and how to be pioneers of peace for your community and how to push the boundaries of human understanding. In the present day world, there is indeed a continuous need of peace pioneers that can replace the paradigm of war and conflict by paradigm of waging peace. A conversation with the Rotary Peace Fellows, clubs will get necessary education and encouragement to further expand Rotary's role and recognition in continuing to bring peace to the world. The aim is to connect the Rotary network with peace building resources. Friends, in 2021, as we heal from COVID-19 pandemic, we are inspired to think creatively and collectively about how to help everyone recover better how to build resilience and how to transform our world into one that is more equal, more just, inclusive, sustainable, and healthier. Indeed, the, the ultimate responsibility of peace rests on the shoulders of people of this globe. On this International Day of Peace, let us join the effort of United Nations on recovering better for a more equitable and peaceful world. Let us promise to make peace not just a priority, but a passion. We are privileged to have in attendance so many distinguished experts and resource persons with us this evening. The five renowned Rotary Peace Fellows who are exceptional leaders in their field. Our keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Noni Gopal Mohanta, Peace Fellow, will speak on the topic, Global Peace Stability and Sustainability. Thereafter, there will be a session in conversation with Rotary Peace Scholars. We have with us the four peace scholars from across the globe who will be sharing their field of work in peace. Rotary Antila Das will moderate the session and Rotary Vivek is their reporter. There will be an interactive session followed by summing up by Dr. Rotary and Dr. Vincent Dada. I am fully confident that your knowledge, experience and expertise will provide important insights on stability and sustainability of peace and we will have an engaging and enriching session ahead. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I would now like to request Rotarian Rima from RCOC Shillong to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Noni Gopal Mohanta. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ma'am has given me a Herculean task to introduce a personality of his stature. He bears many feathers to his hat, so I will be speaking on a few of them. Uh, professor Dr. Noni Gopal Mohanta is a professor from the Political Science Department of Guwahati University, Assam. He has been the head as well as the registrar of the Guwahati University, which is affiliated with 360 colleges. Professor Mohanta is also the director of the Center of South Asian South East 
and his program to facilitate a lot of his research interests through issues in his and identity of politics. Besides being Professor Mohanta is a Rotary Peace Fellow in the University of California, Berkeley in 2002 to 2004. As a Rotary Peace Fellow, he traveled to various parts of the world, including Europe and Asia, for his internship and empirical work. He has published several articles and journals and has written several books and has appeared as an expert in media. And he has also actively participated in issues of the state and the nation through popular writing. Professor Mohanta was given the ERDF. Excellence in 2000 civil responsibilities. He was given Dr. Rongbok the then of Assam Sahin bodies with the Gassam. He's currently members, his consultancy, and his uh, uh, you know expertise in various topics related to the State Planning Commission, which is also, also known as these days as the State Innovation and Transformation Ayogya. He has rendered his consultancies to various departments in I think there is some connectivity issue on Rima's side. Hello. Rima, you are not audible. Yeah, yeah. I think there is some connectivity issue. Maybe we can move on to the speaker. Yes. I would now like to request Professor, our keynote speaker, Professor Nani Gappal Mohanto, to kindly address the gathering. Unmute. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, at the very outset, I would like to extend my greetings and namaskar to all of you. Well, it's a great honor for me to deliver keynote address, and I remain thankful. And my exp I express my sincere gratitude and thanks to the organizers for having given me this responsibility to speak a few words about global peace and stability and sustainability. Respected PDG Manav Choudhury, respected PDG David Gilton and other distinguished past governors, dear Rotarians, dear peace scholars, and ladies and gentlemen. Well, today's topic is global peace, stability, and sustainability. And I have been given about 15 minutes to give my viewpoints. And I feel deeply honored to deliver this keynote address. And thank you, Dr. Rima, for your kind words, although there's a technical hitch, but nevertheless, those were very kind words. And thank you so much. Well, uh, how do I look to give my presentation about global peace, stability, and sustainability? I have three components of my presentation. The first dimension of my presentation would be to look at how do we approach conflict resolution and peace process. That is number one. Then secondly, I would like to talk about briefly about global peace and stability, particularly in the post-COVID world, if I may use the word post-COVID, because I believe the COVID situation, the pandemic situation has created certain uh, certain changes in the global order. And I'd like to look into those dimensions. How is it going to affect the global peace and stability in the days to come from my viewpoint? Uh, I'll give my perspective. I hope uh, this will find, I, uh, you may criticize it, but nevertheless, how do I look at the global peace and stability in the days to come? 
And thirdly, uh, since we have the gathering here of galaxy of our respected past district governors, Rotarians, I'd also like to speak briefly about my role and responsibility as Peace Scholar, because I had the privilege of becoming the Rotary World Peace Fellow at University of California, Berkeley for two years. And I always, I would remain grateful to Rotary International Rotary Foundation for having selected me. And it was a great opportunity. And I would like to tell all the distinguished panelists and all the guests here that this was the greatest experience in my life uh, that I could gather a particularly intellectual tool to look at the issues of conflict resolution and peace process. Now I'm coming to the, what is my approach to conflict resolution and peace process. Well, I look at peace process as a holistic process rather than as an event. We need to go beyond to the whole structural dimension in here. Uh, you know, I would like to adhere to the framework given by Johan Dalto. In fact, he talked about the absence of three factors. That is the structural violence, cultural violence, and direct violence. And he would, the absence of these factors could facilitate the process of conflict resolution and peace process. So when I look at peace process, not to be seen in isolation, not to be seen only in the negative dimension or in positive dimension, it is a holistic process that we need to look at various dimensions. How does it work, the socio-political, cultural, and other dimensions? Well, in today's seminar, the objective framework of the concept note of today's webinar, the purpose is to take insight to the impact of Rotary Peace Scholars also. What is the impact that Rotary Peace Scholars they're making in addressing some of the structural issues of conflict resolution that I also like to talk about so far my role is concerned. Uh, although I do not want to sound pompous, but rather than you know, the general role that I'm trying to play as a Rotary Peace Scholar. Now, uh, when I talk about peace process, I do not uh, consider conflict as uh, totally negative in a negative connotation. I do not look conflict as essentially a negative connotation. It is neither for me a negative concept nor a positive concept. For me, how do we look at conflict depends on its management, how we handle it. You know, it's not necessary that we can have when talking about a peace process. It doesn't mean the absence of contradictions, the absence of, you know, dialectics. So when contradiction is there, only how we resolve it, how we approach conflict, only that can usher a new sustainable peace process. Here, I would like to give you an example how conflict could lead to a peace process. The Baudelaire area, uh, those esteemed scholars or presenters who are not uh, aware about Baudelaire in Assam. Assam, it is a Baudelaire is a tribal dominated area, mostly dominated by the tribal groups, Baudelaire tribal groups in Assam, in Western part. Well, this region called Baudelaire, it is a combination of four districts. And we found that it was agog with violence. It was agog with a lot of contradictions. Uh, classes between the tribal and non-tribal right from 1990s till about 2030. So in this long span, there were contradictions, there were violence, there were terrorist activities, there were kidnapping, uh, then displacement, massive displacement, refusing crisis. But what I'm trying to say is that the negotiation process, the how we approach to the whole issue of conflict is that the state management as well as the role being played by the civil society and gradually it helped to bring best bring back peace process in Baudelaire. I would like to talk about it is not just singular effort that brought a relatively peace process. When I look at peace, it's not absolute peace that I talk about. It is the relative peace because you have to continuously talk about, you have to con continuously engage for a Durable peace process. Peace process cannot be absolute. You have to, you have to be engaged in the process. So when I look at Baudelaire, you know there were first agreement was on 1993, which ultimately didn't work. Then the second agreement was on 2003. Again, it also didn't work. 
Then 2013, another agreement came up. But finally, in a few months back, another agreement was signed with the Bodoland. And today, in Assam, which is the northeastern part of India, which was in at one point of time, one of the most conflict-ridden area now has become perhaps one of the most peaceful area in the country. So what I'm trying to say is that when we look at conflict, let us not necessarily look at conflict as a either positive concept or a negative concept, because it depends on how we handle those structural conflict, looking into the various dimensions, various stakeholders into the peace process, I think will help us to usher the sustainable peace process, process in the days to come. Well, my second dimension, because I have paucity of time, so I would not like to go into the details. The second part that I would like to talk about is the global uh, stability and peace process. Well, here, uh, I would like to draw your attention, and I would like to argue that uh, the COVID situation, the pandemic situation has created certain contradictions. It has created certain situations, how the nation states have reacted to, the, to those COVID situations. Uh, can we call it a post-COVID situation? Well, I do not know because still in India, many people talk about the third wave. But till now, there is a relative recess of the COVID situation, particularly in many states of India, including Assam. So, but if you look at globally, as I look at it, in a post-COVID situation, uh, you know, there are certain perceptible changes occurring in the global order, because today we are talking about global peace and stability. The first change that I, as I observe, is a transformation of globalization to a great extent, focusing more on nationalization. That is number one. Number two, from nationalization, again, giving emphasis to regionalization and local factors getting preponderance in this new process of world order, perhaps, which might emerge in the days to come. I do not say that globalization is over, but there is certain transformative dimension which is occurring to the global globalization as we have, have been with the same since 1990s. Then thirdly, as I observe, is the fact that there's a, there are areas of concern, maybe from democratic leadership, some authoritarian kind of leadership might emerge as a result of you know, the attempt to handle the pandemic situation or the emergency situation. Uh, I would not like to give many examples, but there are concerns how leadership or the political leaders have been trying to address the situation of COVID. And in the, process, in the, in the process, as I look at it, there is an emergence of more authoritarian leadership from a more democratic leadership which is another source of concern for global stability in the days to come. Then fourth dimension is the emergence of techno-nationalism with more intrusive technology that jeopardizes human dignity and freedom of right, I mean, our right to expression and other human dimension, human rights dimension. I do not want to go into detail. And finally, as I look at it, the post-COVID world, if I may again use the word, we need to talk about a transformative or more dominating role by China in the days to come. If China becomes the most dominant actor, what are the changes that are likely to occur in the days to come in the new global order? These are certain, uh, of course, these are not final states that I'm talking about. These are happening or uh, this is a transitional phase, brother. I'm not uh, arguing that you know globalization is over, but there are certain indicators to suggest that uh, you know there's. I mean, people are becoming skeptical. You know that uh, the flow of goods, for example, uh, then the capital goods have been reduced. Exchange of refugees, migration workers refuse. Then the saga of globalization, particularly in the economic dimension particularly in the commerce and trade flow that was there in the pre-pandemic period, it has definitely uh, slowed down uh, in the COVID situation. Now people are, the nations are becoming extremely skeptical about whether this kind of pandemic situation will occur again. And that is why we see, even India is now talking about 
you know, looking into more inward looking economic growth. Uh, for example, focus on domestic market, harnessing the domestic market perhaps would be a big, better and safer option than to go for, uh, you know, globalization process. So I'm not negating the process of globalization, but, you know, the post-COVID situation or the situation in pandemic period has caused certain challenges to the process of globalization and needs to be seen how this kind of situation will impact the global peace and security in the days to come. And again, in the name of the second point that I'm trying to uh, you know, raise my concern is about the emergence of a more authoritarian leadership in the name of tackling COVID or tackling emergency situation. The examples are galore actually in Russia, Turkey, Pakistan, China, and uh, many others of Asian nations in the name of controlling the pandemic situation, controlling the emergency situation, even the democratic leadership now are adopting more authoritarian means to tackle this kind of emergency situation. So therefore the process of democratization, which was more uh, transparent, more vibrant, I believe, uh, I do not say that democratic leadership is over. And uh, you know, my observation is more relative, but I witness certain more authoritarian tendencies among even, uh, even among many democratic countries in the name of tackling emergency situation in the name of tackling the COVID situation. And we again see the emergence of, you know, a more technocratic nationalistic uh, assertions. For example, China's, uh, when China tried to push India back in the border situation, uh, in the Galwan, you know, in the Ladakh region, uh, India then backfired with certain banning of about more than 59 bans. I mean, India banned more than 59 apps. So uh, not only India, then we found series of banning of, you know, uh, apps and like, for example, TikTok. TikTok was one of the most popular, uh, you know, that uh, app that was popular among the Indian youth and Indian society. And in fact, there's at one point of time, there's 60 million download of TikTok in India. But there was, you know, India, uh, India retorted back to China by banning about more than, uh, more than 59 apps. And similar situations also happen in Hong Kong, then also in uh, UK, as well as in United States of America, we found that there is a battle for technocratic dominance and uh, there's a rebuttal against China also came back uh, effectively against some, such banning. So what I'm trying to say is that my argument is that are we witnessing a China-centric world order? Because so far, uh, what we found, what we, what we had essentially was an American dominant world order, although there's not single power structure, which was the epitome of power, but nevertheless, it was a uh, multidimensional power structures. There was not hegemonic force or singular force. Nevertheless, it was more of American uh, dominant power world order. But today with the emergence of China, as the world power in terms of economy, in terms of polity, it has also led to a situation of counter mobilization. For example, China's ambitious plan about Belt and Road Initiative. And there are certain contradictions which, if I do not raise, would not uh, enable us to deal with the issues of conflict and its resolution, particularly its focus on CPEC, China Pakistan Economic Corridor. It is leading to new vista of contradictions between India, Pakistan, and China relationship. The triangular is becoming contradictory in the, in the context of CPEC, that is China Pakistan Economic Corridor, because it is violating, uh, as, as per international law, some of the sovereignty issues of India. So, I mean, with the rise of China as an economic giant, as a political giant, as a stability provider, as a security provider, that is also leading to counter mobilization. For example, the emergence of Quad, quadrilateral security dialogue between, I mean, with USA, Japan, India, and Australia. A new security architecture is emerging, and uh, China's assertion in, uh, in South China, for example, in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, these 
And uh, the change is that it falls to the smaller nations. It is also causing contradictions and assertion of quad power, quad power in Southeast Asia. So how this kind of mobilization or gradual emergence of China as a world economic power, as a world military power would lead to stability. I think these are certain, I'm flagging off certain uh, issues in front of my esteemed uh, peace scholars. Uh, if you ask me, do you have an answer? Well, I cannot possibly give you a ready-made answer. But what I'm trying to say is that whether there is a transformative shift to China in terms of controlling world power, and the problem is that there are certain issues that to be dealt with so far as China is concerned because it is essentially a closed political system. So how do you deal with it in such a scenario where democracy is not the essence of its political structure? So there are certain issues that need to be, uh, need to be addressed, whether dialogue is the only way, whether uh, border intrusion, and also there are certain transnational issues, for example, water sharing with India. We have transnational uh, river like Brahmaputra, uh, which passes from China to India, then it goes to Bangladesh. But there are, uh, you know, due to surface of data sharing of uh, you know, how the river Brahmaputra flows and its behavior during summer season, it leads to heavy inundation in India and also in Bangladesh. So how can we talk about greater transnational cooperation with China I think is a big challenge in the days to come. So in my viewpoint, these are some of the challenges that is emerging uh, uh, so far as global security, because today's uh, webinar is about global peace and stability and sustainability. And because the today's world order is in a flux, the dominant role being played by America and its gradual, uh, gradual if I may use the word, displacement or its withdrawal from many areas like Iran, even Afghanistan, and withdrawal from many multilateral global institutions, they're creating a vacuum, is creating certain contradictions, and how these contradictions would be made in the days to come is a serious issue that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. Well, I do not want to go into the details of those parameters that I have talked about. Uh, we can have a discussion in the next session perhaps. Now I'm coming to the third part of today's seminar, that is the investment that has been made on Rotary Peace Scholars and uh, what is the role being played by Rotary Peace Fellows? Well, uh, I have seen, uh, although the impact cannot be very much palpable, but it, as I have said, peace is a process uh, that requires multilateral effort, that requires multi-institutional role, and uh, the individuals can definitely play, play an important role. Uh, if I may say so to the August gathering, uh, the esteemed colleagues in front of my esteemed respected colleagues present here, well, I would like to uh, periodize my role as a Rotary Peace Scholar in my post uh, scholarship phase into three areas. My first uh, role was to launch a new program called Peace and Conflict Resolution in Guwahati University, that is my first effort. My second effort was to launch a new program called Center for Southeast Asian Studies in Guwahati University in sync with ACTIS policy. And third role, that is now, which is the latest role that I'm trying to play. Uh, you know, I have been uh, appointed as the advisor to the government of Assam to look into the issues of education and skill. So uh, that is another, I think, uh, role that has been assigned to me only about a month back. So these three areas I'm trying to look at. And when we introduced peace and conflict resolution at Guwahati University, at that point of time, if I may say so, that at that point of time, not just India, uh, uh, which is a conglomerate of eight Indian states, uh, was the epitome, was the main center for India's conflict situation, along with Kashmir. Kashmir was not the only point which had witnessed a uh, series of structured violence. Notice India was at that point of time also witnessed mindless violence, terrorist activities, arson, kidnapping, and transnational violence. And if I may say so, because Northeast India conglomerate of eight Indian states is surrounded by 
99% border is with Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Himalayan countries. For example, we are connected with China, we are connected with Bangladesh, we are connected with Bhutan, Nepal, Myanmar. So this kind of transnational character of India's North is added to a new dimension of terrorism because of logistical support across border. And at that point of time, we through the institution, the peace and conflict resolution program, tried to initiate series of dialogue, series of negotiation with the, uh, those incident groups who came for a negotiation with government of India. So I think at that point of time, we tried to play a role of negotiator among various contending forces, both with the violent groups as well as with the civil society group, because not just India, I think India's democracy uh, is a vibrant uh, democracy. And India's Northeast is a very typical example of the test of Indian democracy, because the amount of heterogeneity that, we, that you have in Northeast India, more than 185 languages, more than 270 ethnic groups. So this is an ethnic cauldron. It is a immensely diverse society. At that point of time, it was riddled with ethnic violence. So uh, I would not say that it is our role, but government also played a very proactive role. In fact, uh, Indian nation state, I would argue, is a very successful model in Turbul, particularly uh, in developing countries that have adopted a very relatively successful model in, in accommodating the interest of various ethnic insurgent groups. We have succeeded and Indian state has shown sufficient flexibility in accommodating this diverse interest. And my second uh, you know, role was to introduce Center for Southeast Asian Studies, what Manoj does. I respect him a lot. In fact, I have learned a lot from a uh, past district governor, Manoj Choudhury. Manoj Choudhury talked about people to people contact. In fact, through the Center of Center for uh, Southeast Asian Studies, we have initiated series of student exchange program with, with Myanmar, with, with Bhutan, as well as with, uh, with, with Laos and with Thailand. So we're trying to initiate a track three diplomacy in terms of bringing the people of Northeast India with Southeast Asia to whom we are organically connected. As I say, 99% uh, border of India's Northeast is with South and Southeast Asia. And my third role, now I have been invited to join as the advisor to the government of Assam. So I'm trying to look into the implementation of a new education policy, which I believe is a very holistic educational package for the development of primary sector, secondary sector, and higher education uh, in, in India's Northeast. Because uh, in terms of human development indices, uh, Northeast India is very backward in terms of achieving uh, you know, gender parity and also in achieving uh, certain basic parameters in, in the areas of primary education and secondary education. Well, I do not want to go into details. These are some of the activities that I am trying to undertake in the days to come. Uh, well, uh, it is not possible to uh, deal with all the issues in this 15, 16 minutes presentation. Once again, I would like to express my sincere gratitude and thanks and regards to all of you for having given me this opportunity. It's nice to be back to my original family. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Jai Hind. Jai Aho. Thank you, sir, for your very informative and thought-provoking keynote address. Yes, indeed, peace is a continuous process and participation of all the stakeholders, the individual institutions and organizations like Rotary, everyone is necessary. The challenges to global uh, peace stability that are emerging, yes, indeed, something which needs to be deliberated upon. Thank you so much, sir. We are indeed very grateful and nice that you have spared your valuable time and shared all the activities that you have so far done as a peace fellow of Rotary. And I'm sure with your new assignment with the government of Assam, with your new responsibilities, definitely our state will be benefited. Thank you once again, sir. Next, now we, will, we have come to the next part of this program where there will be a con in conversation with the peace fellows. 
Now I hand over the proceedings to Rotarian Tilak Das, who will be moderating this session. Rotarian Tilak Das, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Thank you. Uh, welcome to this part of the webinar of Global Peace and Sustainability by RID 6240. I'm Rotarian Tilak Das, past president of Rotary Club of Guwahati West. And, and moderator for this session. Now today, uh, being the World Peace Day, I would like to convey my greetings to all of you on this World Peace Day. We have today very prominent uh, alumni from Rotary Peace Scholars, four of them from across the globe. Their names have been already stated before. They're, I welcome all of them once again. Uh, but uh, oh, let me tell you that, okay, they are all uh, making a force in building the environment for peace to grow. What is the Rotary's goal today? And sustain in the world. Now we will have a conversation with uh, Omar Gobin from Switzerland, Monica Fennel from USA, Louis Ein from India, and Dixon Igwe from Nigeria in that order. What I would appreciate if uh, all the uh, peace scholars keep their conversation uh, in 10 minutes or so uh, to make it clear so that we can have uh, at the end of all the four, uh, four guests, we'll have a 15 minute slot for open session where the, all the participants can have their questions, their clarifications and all, and give their feedback also. So uh, to the participants, uh, to, to all the participants, you can write down your questions or your uh, clarification that you need on any topic uh, in the chat box. And then uh, please mention, don't forget to mention your name and the name of the person whom this question is addressed to. So this is how the format of the uh, today's conversation would be. Now, let me just start off with a few words about Rotary's, uh, how Rotary creates the environments where peace can happen. Now that's what uh, is the Rotary goal. So by through carrying out the different service projects, supporting peace fellowship as we all have been seeing it, and Rotarians take action in underlying uh, causes of conflict, including poverty, discrimination, ethnic tension, lack of access to education, unequal distribution of resources. Now, all those the Rotarians, they are on an ongoing basis, continuously have been working on that. So that the environment is created where peace can sustain. We are approaching the concept of peace uh, with greater cohesion and inclusivity today broadening the scope of what we mean by peace building. We finding more ways to, for people to get involved in the peace building process of Rotary. So the commitment of Rotary today answers new challenges in peace, how we can make the greatest possible impact. That's what uh, just now Dr. Nonigopal Monto was mentioning about how the impact Rotary is creating on the peace building process and also how we achieve the vision of Rotary for lasting change. Now, uh, today we would look forward to all these four, four guests, four peace scholars, to give us more insight in the visions of the Rotary. To start with, uh, may I invite uh, Mr. May I invite Mr. Omer Govan from Switzerland. A uh, very interesting person, uh, Mr. Omer. Govan, he has done his bachelor's in electrical engineering followed by master's in telecommunication. He is a peace fellow from the Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok. And I'm very happy that uh, I'm part today for the, for, uh, the batch mix to come together, even virtually for a get together of your batch mix. I'm very happy to be part of it. And I'm sure you'll, you're enjoying the conversation with your, with your fellow batch mix also. So Omer, uh, now presently he's working as a CEO of Episbal. This is an organization which is a competence center for professional integration, for assessment and training of mentally impaired people and integrate them in a labor market. What a challenging job it must be. You know, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of, lot of problems, a lot of challenges uh, to do that. Prior to this assignment, he was associated with Save the Children in Switzerland. And he was also the Swiss core Red Cross representative in Middle East and North Africa uh, during the Arab Spring and beginning of Syria war. Now he has seen the conflicts in the field 
uh, in the real world conflict that we talk about and we read about. He was also the head of business development in University Hospital and Basel, and also senior manager in Accenture. Now, uh, Govind, uh, I, I would request you to start off with your presentation. But uh, just before that, uh, I just want to want to have one word about you. That uh, what was this? There is a big shift from you from a technical person to a change agent to to working for the people. Now, what, what triggered off that change in you? If you can share with us, maybe it will inspire us. Thank you very much. Uh, very kind. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. And thank you for the kind introduction. Just a quick remark. I sent a presentation beforehand. Is it possible Did the uh, presentation arrive or? Yes, uh, we can do that presentation. You want me to start okay. it? Okay. Great. Yes. Or yeah, if, it's good to know that it's there. But you're, to, you're talking about uh, kind of like a big uh, transformation of myself, as I wrote in my uh, CV that I changed from a hardcore techie uh, to become a hardcore change management organization development. Uh, the way it came along is that I worked as a technical consultant and I realized that changes or projects uh, with technical systems is something that you can more or less plan. But the more interesting thing is to how do you get people to, to change, to, to be able to fly and, and use the systems properly. Back then I worked consultant and I was always interested in uh, can you still hear me yes yes yes, yes. please carry on please yeah. carry on okay great I there was a sorry um so I was much more interested in people and how to enable them to to go through change and to empower them I thought it was just challenging and doing technical stuff with technical stuff, you, you can have a workaround uh, technical wise, but with people to react accordingly, you never can plan how they react and then you need to adopt certain things. But it has been some time ago, like almost 20 years ago. So, yeah, just in terms of your question, in terms of I change project uh, as well. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Yet. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to your presentation for the challenging job that you are uh, engaged right now. Uh, I think there are a lot of learning there, so we'll we'll go ahead. Please go ahead with that. Thank you very much. If you can put up the presentation, please, that would be great. Thank you so much. First of all, I, I truly want to express my, my true pleasure and honor to, to speak uh, here today. And also, I wanted to express my big um, uh, gratitude and also thankfulness towards you and Rotary for creating this uh, great program where I've been part of like nine years ago. And I can promise you the seed that has been planted there nine years ago has been unfolded in many uh, different ways. Uh, in my role as delegate of the Swiss Red Cross in the Middle East, uh, as CEO of Save the Children, and now my work here uh, at Episphere. And it has unfolded also in towards my family, my friends, my colleagues, and towards my, uh, my uh, environment as well. So thank you very much. And um, this program is great. And I hope it continues to unfold even more uh, on a global level. Uh, what you see here is, is a view on our competence center, Apisper. That's uh, the, the name of it. Uh, it's, it uh, it's located uh, closer to Zurich. Uh, and also overlooking the Lake of Zurich, which is a very beautiful location. But even more important, what is our mission or why does Apisberg exist? We accompany young people with impairments, mostly psychological, uh, some of it uh, phys uh, physical, in their integration into the primary labor market and thus into their personal independence. One thing you might realize or see that I haven't called those people, people with handicaps or impairments. That this is due to because we are more resource oriented than deficit oriented in our thinking. So that's not, we don't consider them as handicapped or impaired uh, or as handicapped. The second thing is, and that's something which I realize is really a beautiful mission to have the integration into their into the primary labor market. That means we, we do, they do their apprenticeship, 
in a way that they can be uh, working in the primary labor market, meaning that they no, don't need any additional help and they can live their personal independence, which I, th I think is quite strong. So they can also live a dignified life and also possibly uh, founding a family. If you go on the next slide. This is the view of the annual report from last year. We could celebrate our 55th year uh, in this formation as Apisberg is today. However, Apisberg, interestingly enough, now that we are uh, in the COVID times, was founded in the 30s and was also a center for treating tuberculosis. And back then also vaccination brought the relief uh, in terms of fighting this uh, disease. The sculpture you see uh, is quite interesting because it has been created by a former employee of Apisberg who has been working here for quite some time. And also you recognize the logo of Apisberg there, but even more important, this sculpture reflects what we do in Apisberg. As I said, our mission is to integrate people with impairments into the first labor market. So how we do that? is if you look at the two orange figures in the middle, uh, the, the triangle, the, high, uh, the light blue one, the two orange people, this is actually where our participants who are doing an apprenticeship can learn their profession and become skilled experts in their profession in a protected environment. So this is where, uh, where, they, uh, where we work at Apisberg. If you look at the uh, figures outside, that is where they work as independent uh, people and strengthen the workplace of Switzerland. And it also should show on one hand the different professions they can learn from us, but also their different uh, personalities as well. So this is quite a strong statement here in Apisberg, and it's in the center of our facilities, facilities here, uh, this sculpture. And also the foundation shows that the strong foundation that we have is in terms of our employees. And I have the highest admiration for them, educating our young people in, in their young age with some of uh, with their impairments to become uh, educated, skilled workers as well. And also the, um, it all shows also that we want to be a part of the overall system uh, to make sure that uh, the convention of the UN disability rights are being taken care of and addressed uh, here in Switzerland. If you can go to the next page. The participants are in the center in all of our work we do. That is very critical. Um, we have a so-called reference person system. So that means if you look at the inner circle, all our participants are accompanied by personal contact person and the team of experts. The vocational trainers are, uh, and job clarifiers, they provide the instruction in everyday work and give regular feedback. The case managers that you see there as well, or job coaches, they are their career counselors and coordinate the contact with internal and external stakeholders and provide advice on various topics for those participants. The social pedagogues accompany life in the Apisberg. We have 30 out of our 60 participants are living here in Apisberg and they accompany their life here on Apisberg. And also we have therapists and teachers that provide them a uh, certain uh, support as needed. For the outside circle is also what we need with our partner or companies. We have solutions for internships. We also make sure they are being positioned in different co uh, companies. We provide follow-up solutions for the participants and also um, look at different things for them to make sure further uh, in their profession. It's the role of the parents or the family. 
relationship with their parents and guardians is consciously shaped. That's also something where we interact with independence of young people is encouraged. And especially by going, by being here in Uppisburg, is encouraged with a view to their coming uh, independence in the Swiss working place or in their uh, independent life. But also we have some, and you see that on top, the assigning agencies as well. Um, this is now different agencies, such as uh, the, uh, it's a terrible name. It's still called that way here in Switzerland. It's terrible, and I apologize. It's called the Handicap Insurance. Uh, provides the financing and also sends us the participants. But we have also developed a new offering for uh, refugees uh, to do uh, an assessment and also education for them here uh, in Apisper. So as you can see, and I'm closing the circle, we have also uh, therapists who make sure on the outer circle that the, the participant in the center can succeed to become a skilled expert in their profession. Again, the participants are always in the center and we start their education with, in mind with the integration into first labor market so they can live an independent uh, life as well. If you go on the next slide, and it's uh, in German, I don't expect you to, to uh, learn German for this presentation, but this was something very important for me. And it says here, we are educating future skilled experts. What you don't see here is that we are educating young people with impairments to future skilled workers, because by the end of the day is what we do. We build uh, future skilled experts for the workplace for Switzerland and strengthen the eco uh, economy. So the impairment kind of disappears in a way. The other thing you see down there, and you're not gonna be able to read it, but we have a professional education in 10 areas, such as electronic, gardening, housekeeping, informatic, ICT, cooking and kitchen, logistics, mechanic, carpenter, technical service, and application development, which is the youngest uh, department we have. So in all those 10 areas, people can learn a uh, profession. So I would like to invite you also, if you should, if it should happen that you're in the neighborhood, and this is an open invitation, I invite you to please stop by here, uh, especially during lunchtime, so you can appreciate uh, the great cooking that our participants do and the friendly service of our housekeeping as well. So this is an open invitation to all of you. Uh, so please stop by if you happen to be in Switzerland uh, or close to Zurich. On the next slide. Here we have the announcement that we congratulate our participant who finished the apprenticeship. This year, again, 100% of the participants have passed the exams. And I wanna emphasize that those participants, again, have taken the same tests as the other uh, uh, apprentices from, from the same profession. So it's the same test as well. And they have, again, uh, passed with an average high grade, and even the practical work is even a higher uh, average grade they received. So we're very, very proud of them uh, that they have done this and also have given them the possibility to be integrated in the uh, first labor market uh, here in, in Switzerland. Then on the last slide, Yes. I mean, we all know that education is very important and HILS helps to, to uh, create peace. But what I found was quite interesting when I asked what my uh, trainers are proud of or the employees of uh, Appisberg are proud of, of their participants. And it was quite interesting. There are two things uh, that came out that I would like to highlight, which is especially in Switzerland, perhaps among the young people, not seen that much more, which uh, saddens me a bit. But however, here in Appisberg, it's quite strong. The first one is they truly develop a, 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 a proudness or are proud of their profession in a very 
interesting way. I give you an example. On a Friday afternoon, the weekend was coming. It was a beautiful day, a beautiful weekend ahead of us. And I met one of the participants working in carpeting or getting an education as a carpenter. And she was in a good mood. And, and uh, I said, yeah, how are you? She said, yeah, I'm in a very good mood. And, and I said, I usually do that. I said, why are you in a good mood? Or what made it happen? But I expected the answer. Yeah, it's weekend. I'm done with my week and so on. But what she said was, you know, I learned a lot. I could clean up my place and my trainer was happy with me. So this is quite amazing. I don't see that enough anymore among the young people. So this is one thing, and that's more or less with all of them. They really develop a, a proudness or are proud on their profession they're learning. So that's very exciting to see. The second thing which I would like to highlight is that the people are, are there's a no violent or no mobbing um, environment here. So among the young people, they're, they're not, they're treating themselves with respect and they don't do any mobbing or any violent, which becomes very important. We had a case a few months ago where I talked to the mother um, of a, a, a participant here and he got beaten up by three young people uh, in the open and he was very scared to come back or go out again. And I could reassure his mother that when he's here, and he came uh, then with a service here from the Swiss Red Cross, when he's here, she doesn't need to worry about him because people are treating them with respect or there's no violence or no mobbing among the young people. So this is something I wanted to uh, say as, as closing statements. What you see here, you might ask yourself is, uh, it says feel good, that means uh, good luck. Uh, my daughter, who is in the meantime 11 years old, has drawn that for me when I went for my interview with Appisburg because she was really uh, looking for me forward to, to work here, but also for my first day here at Appisburg that she wished me and also the, the, the trainers uh, and the employees of Appisburg. And I want to extend this good luck to, to all of you as well. And, and again, thank you for all the work you're doing, the time you're taking and also for creating this great program of uh, peace fellowships. Thank you. I realize my Thank English you. is a bit, bit No, no, uh, it's wonderful. So, uh, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful listening to you. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, challenges, your job, uh, which is uh, very, very inspiring for all of us. And uh, I, I say, no, that's a great thing that you are doing is to give in, giving them back their confidence, their self-respect, and then making them worthy of uh, making a living out of uh, whatever the skills that you're giving. Now, this gives the immense uh, uh, pride among the people uh, who, who generally are look at a, at, at a discriminatory manner. So that those things, I think, I think it's, a, it's a great takeaway from what you're, what you're doing and what are the contribution to the society. Thank you so much, Umar. Please Thank stay you. stay with us. Uh, we'll, we'll have an open conversation after we want to make the presentations. And I'm sure there will be some very interesting questions and interactions with you also. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, before I uh, invite the next guest, uh, let me just say that you know, Rotary uh, has got four roles in promoting peace. First is that uh, Rotary members have, are the practitioners who are fighting diseases, providing clean water and sanitation, improving health of mothers and children, supporting education and growing local economies directly, build the optimal condition for peaceful societies. Now that's what the Rotarians are doing it as practitioners. As mediators, our members have negotiated humanitarian ceasefires in areas of conflict, like the chairman said in the beginning, or in the chairman comments in the beginning, and then to allow the polio vaccinator and all those to operate there in the, in the very difficult conditions. There are advocates who are our members on integral role as respected impartial participants during the peace processes and in post-conflict reconstruction, as uh, Dr. Nunigopal Mohanto was mentioning his role. You know, we focus on creating communities and convening groups that are connected, inclusive, and resilient. The other one role that, that we have is that Rotary has got the educators. So our Rotary Peace Centers have trained more than around 1,400 peace scholars. Four of them are today with us from different parts of the globe. And to become effective catalysts for peace 
through careers in government, education, international organizations. So one such uh, more advocate that we have is Monica Fennell from US. Uh, hi, Monica, welcome uh, to this webinar. Thank you. Okay, a few words about Monica. She is, uh, she is from Indian Police, USA, a relatively peace scholar, alumni of Chalongkorn University in Bangkok, like all the other three participants today. Uh, she teaches constitutional law, access to justice, poverty law, and community meditation as an adjunct professor in Butler University, USA. Please do correct me, Monica. Uh, this is what I have with me, few words. Uh, as a pro bono director, Monica leads the pro bono program across the law firm, Teft, Statinals, and Holisters, 12 offices. She has also served as the executive director of Indiana Pro Bono Commission and a fellow at the Supreme Court of the United States. It's a wonderful uh, uh, to be you uh, to have you on the on board this evening. I'm sure there are many things that we want to know about from you. But tell us something more about this as, as your role as a pro bono director in the law firm. You know how what is the structure? What are the processes that involve? Like how does an ordinary person have access to these facilities? You know uh, because we have in India, I'm sure some lawyer friends who are present here in this evening, they will come back with you that we have state legal advisory bodies where the free legal advices are given to the people. Uh, but, and, the, and the process is free, you know, it's pre bono also here. But then what, what happens in the US, like, you know, how do you do it? And then uh, also we'd like to understand that what are the human rights initiatives and innovations that, that you see or happen uh, with you during this pandemic period where the community itself has gone through huge challenges. Uh, so, and also, you know, at the end, like, you know, what are the tools uh, that you're using now, you know, as a, as a peace building, as a peace fellow, you know, you must have got a number of tools that have been given to you during these courses. And that will be very interesting to know because we who have not attended the, had the opportunity or, or been fortunate to have these courses, Maybe we learn a little bit from you and use those tools sometime in life. Thank you so much, Monica, being with us. Uh, it's over to you. All right. Thank you so much for uh, to District Thirty Two Forty for having me today and for um, creating this International um, Day of Peace webinar. Uh, really appreciate. Um, everyone who's here, but in particular, um, it's great to see my peace fellow colleagues from Nigeria, Switzerland, and India. Um, I'm sure they would agree with me that the uh, Rotary program at Chulalong Corn University had a huge impact. I mean, nine years later, so we're still collaborating and still learning from each other, which um, is really a privilege for me. So thank you to all the Rotarians for your support of these programs, and um, also for focusing on peace and conflict resolution. So <clears throat> I don't usually start my biography with where I was born, uh, but I do have to tell you, I was born in Evanston, Illinois in the United States, and that is the headquarters of Rotary. So it's in the Chicago area, um, and I grew up uh, close to Rotary headquarters. So I think I've always known about Rotary uh, my dentist office was uh, in the Rotary building and there were flags from all around the world, which was really uh, neat. So I went to, just to give you the quick overview, I went to law school in Washington, DC at Georgetown University and I practiced law in Chicago. I always volunteered, uh, but I didn't make the shift um, to full-time access to justice work until I became, uh, till I moved to Indiana, which is where I am now. I live actually in a rural area. And here I'm, I'm speaking to you from my office in Indianapolis, which is uh, a sort of a medium sized city here. Um, I, so I was the director of the Indiana Pro Bono Commission, which is a statewide volunteer lawyer network for 10 years. And that's what I was doing at the time I met all of my uh, Peace Fellows colleagues who are here. Um, I did take some time, um, as uh, the moderator mentioned, to be a U.S. Supreme Court fellow, so I worked at the court there. And one of my favorite things to do was to uh, give the briefings to the foreign delegations that came through the court. So it's always um, great to hear about other court systems, too, and talk about ours um, 
with people from other countries. So as you mentioned, I'm the pro bono director at the law firm of Tass, Titinius and Hollister. We have about 12 offices and 600 attorneys, if that gives you an idea of the number of people I work with. And I'll explain a little bit about what I do as pro bono director and how I fit in that access to justice system. But um, it sounds like you're interested in hearing more and there might be some lawyers. I wasn't sure how many lawyers we might have. Um, feel free to jump in with questions or ask me questions at the end. I could probably um, talk all day, but we don't have all day. Uh, <clears throat> you also mentioned I'm uh, an adjunct professor at Butler University and I teach uh, community mediation, uh, constitutional law and access to justice and poverty law, not all at once. <laughs> I only have time to teach one class at a time. Um, and mediation, um, just to answer one of your other questions and I'll talk more about mediation. For me, that was one of the great uh, units that we had when we were studying at Chulalongkorn University. Uh, Professor Jan Sanu uh, came and uh, taught us all some mediation techniques. I think many of us were already using some of them, but it's, it's really great to be able to um, study them in that context. So a focus of my work is making the justice system more accessible. Um, people who aren't represented by attorneys, what we call pro se litigants or self-represented litigants. And I could probably talk about that term all day long too, because uh, people say, well, if you don't have an attorney, you're not exactly self-represented. Um, so anyway, but people have trouble navigating um, a system that can be complex and technical, and they may not have the money to hire an attorney. And as you might guess, the civil legal needs um, of the poor far outstrip the available resources for free legal help, um, whether it's legal aid staff attorneys, so you know, paid full-time staff attorneys that can help on their cases, or volunteers, uh, volunteer attorneys serving pro bono. And that's really what I focus, focus on is the latter, but um, all of those systems are interconnected. Um, and accessibility can mean a lot of things. And I think hearing uh, Omar's presentation made me think about uh, disability rights, it um, plays into that. And also um, I loved uh, Omar's graphic with um, the participant uh, centered design, participant centered design is also a concept that uh, we try to think about when we think about court accessibility, uh, because often as lawyers and judges, uh, we think about our perspective and not actually the user perspective uh, for the courts. Um, you also mentioned the COVID crisis and you know, not surprisingly, it's created a backlog of cases in the courts. We had a moratorium on eviction, so um, landlords could not um, basically throw tenants on the street during COVID in certain in most situations. <laughs> and uh, the various moratoria are being lifted. And so one of the things facing the courts is how to handle the oncoming tsunami of uh, housing cases. Um, the good, if I can say something uh, good, uh, about the pandemic. It's forced the legal field to innovate. Um, lawyers are notoriously slow to adapt uh, technology, but it has forced uh, lawyers and courts to try new methods of resolving disputes and new methods of communicating. So for example, here we have a pilot project in the courts that's installing video conferencing so that unrepresented litigants can come into the courthouse uh, to use that video conferencing to join their court hearings um, and any other online proceedings. Or um, a litigant uh, could join uh, from their phone. Um, and one of the things that is helpful about that is then uh, people don't have to take as much time off of work um, and get transportation to the courthouse. Um, so if we can resolve disputes, and this gets to our um, kind of peace topic before they get to the point of filing a court case, uh, or even once they're filed before the judge holds hearings and makes decisions, we can often save time for the parties and potentially get a better result. Um, mediation can be one of those ways that we might be able to address that backlog um, of cases um, you know, cases that backed up during COVID. 
Um, and in my area, we are piloting a program that would uh, get mediators to low income uh, parties for free. Um, the courts would pay the mediators a, a low fee, much less than they could get on the market. Um, but uh, it would help them get the disputes resolved and it wouldn't uh, cost the parties anything. Um, from what I'm hearing, online mediation seems to be working well, and I expect that even after COVID, there'll be uh, more online dispute resolution. Um, since I'm a big believer in alternative dispute resolution and getting conflicts resolved outside of court, I think um, it's great that mediation is uh, becoming more accessible. Um, one of the things that uh, I think the pandemic has exacerbated, and this won't surprise any of you either, is the inequities in the justice system. And it's important to um, look at court access through a racial justice lens. And as lawyers, um, I think a lot of us feel that we have uh, a responsibility to serve underrepresented communities and um, to increase our efforts to bring about systemic change. And lawyers and law firms are uniquely positioned. So I, I work at a, a law firm and work with lawyers volunteering and uh, they're uniquely positioned to be able to help in that way. Um, one of the things, oh, I forgot to mention on mediation that I didn't want uh, to forget because again, it was something we talked about um, in our studies at Chulalong Court University is uh, forgiveness and apologizing. And um, you know, sometimes in mediation, you think about money and um, how much um, money are you going to settle a case for. But sometimes um, apologies can be part um, of that resolution. Um, you know, parties go to court and they think they want revenge or some kind of um, validation by the judge. But often um, part of what they're looking for is recognition of that injury of the hurt and to also to move on um, with their lives. And uh, one of the things that we studied there is looking at the third side um, in mediation, looking at the party's interests um, and you know, part of what they may propose as part of a settlement is recognition um, of the harm that's been done. Um, so uh, just to give you a little taste of what I'm working on currently um, and to everything can uh, come back to the pandemic. Uh, when I was director of the Indiana Pro Bono Commission, which is now, uh, I, met, I met many of these Peace Fellows nine years ago. Um, one of the things I was working on at that time was uh, a way uh, which then was um, much more innovative than it would be now, but uh, was a way to join people virtually, um, join lawyers, particularly getting, leveraging that, you know, the density of lawyers in urban areas to get some help to our rural areas. And um, if neither one is going to, you know, to have enough time to travel to see each other, perhaps we can meet each other online. And uh, so um, I helped create an online uh, free legal help resource uh, here. And, uh, you know, never knew that it was gonna become so valuable during the pandemic because so many free legal help clinics uh, are in person and they shut down uh, very precipitously. All of a sudden um, people didn't have a way to access help but they could go to this online resource and it's basically just by email that lawyers answer questions. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's not everything. It's, it's only brief advice, um, but it was something during the pandemic that, um, that really grew um, the number of questions asked online, but also the number of lawyers um, volunteering uh, really grew during the pandemic, uh, or at least volunteering online in that way. Um, one other uh, quick thing to note um, as an innovation that is relevant to the pandemic and feels very relevant is medical legal partnerships. 
Um, so those are kind of a holistic way of looking at uh, issues that people may have. So there's a medical legal partnership at the public hospital here in uh, Indianapolis. And it's a place where uh, the low income community is already going for free medical care. Um, and so we bring, uh, and when it's not a pandemic, we do it um, in person, but um, we now had to do it virtually. We bring lawyers uh, to the hospital where people are already comfortable going and getting help and provide help in the um, uh, legal realm. What we have to do as part of this medical legal partnership to really make it work is educate uh, the, lawyer, the um, doctors and the nurses and the medical staff about how to spot those legal needs. So they need to be able to um, see someone who has those needs and refer them um, to this uh, free legal help. So um, that's also part of it is, you know, telling them, well, here's what the standard is for guardianship. And if you need help getting a guardianship, um, send them to us. Or uh, here's, uh, well, I, I don't even, I, I think this is obvious. This doesn't so much need education, but then they refer people to us for wills and advanced health care directives and things like that. Um, and during COVID, we had to figure out how to do that uh, remotely, which is, um, was a challenge, but I think that'll help us going forward. So um, that's just a little snapshot. I'm happy to answer questions. And again, thank you so much for um, inviting me and for hosting this um, peace webinar. Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much. Uh, it was wonderful listening to you. Uh, yes, your job, like your role is such an impactful uh, uh, role that you play in the in building the environment for building peace. That's wonderful. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, today's chairperson, uh, Dr. Pubali Bojo is also a practitioner, practicing advocate. So I'm sure she will be very she will be very keen to have an interaction uh, after the during the open session and all. So uh, it's it's nice uh, the virtual uh, uh, interactions and meditation. Meditation that we have mentioned is also being practiced today in India during the pandemic period by most of the courts. So I'm sure the experience sharing would be very interesting there. Uh, so thank you once again, Monica. Uh, thank you for joining us. Please stay with us if you if you have if you can spare a few more minutes uh, so that at the end of it, I'm sure there will be a lot of people that to uh, ask a few things from you. Thank you so much once again. Okay, I move on. Uh, that. We uh, the more uh, the keynote speaker did mention about uh, the conflicts, did mention about the negative connotations of conflicts, and then uh, about peace building process and all. But there is something called positive peace also. I'm sure that peace builders, you are all aware of it for the common people because when you say peace, peace will have two parts of it. One is a positive peace. Now, positive peace uh, is something, uh, some term which has been introduced in 1960s. Uh, by sociologist uh, Johan Galtung, or Galtung as you pronounce it, I'm not very sure. Okay, that it is actually defined as an attitude, institutions and structures that create and sustain peaceful societies. These same factors also lead to many other positive outcomes which society feels are important. Higher levels of positive peace are statistically linked to higher GDP growth, better environmental outcomes, higher measures of well-being, better development outcomes, and stronger resilience. Now, this is what the positive piece that we're talking about. Now, we have, uh, I will invite Louis Ayn, uh, for retired IPS officer, who has recently retired as Deputy Inspector General of Police of Government of Assam, India. Louis, are you there? Louis, uh, can you join? Please, he's not here. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, oh, yes, here. we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. You know, yeah, welcome, here. welcome, Luis. It's good to see you after such a long time. Just now, I can't see. Yeah, now I can see. You. It's good. But I must tell you that I am quite surprised. You know, uh, to know that you have retired. You know, I never thought that. You know, uh, you you are going to retire so soon. You know, uh, are you sure you retired on a superannuation or voluntary retirement? <sighs> 
<laughs> retired, actually retired, super, super annuated. Okay, okay. That's fine, that's fine. So how, how are you enjoying the retired life? Yeah, that's what I'll be speaking about in a while. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, it takes time to sing the, because uh, retirement is, is a process which, which also you have to get used to it. So uh, Luis uh, has been in the Punjab Police Service, as, as I mentioned, as retired as a Deputy Inspector General of Police of Government Assam in India. Uh, he, was a, he has done a complete course in international peace and conflict resolution in Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok in 2012 at the same batchmate of all other peace scholars today. And he is instrumental in bringing you all on board. Thank you so much, Luis, on, the, on behalf of the Rotary for bringing all, all your friends across uh, today, across the globe uh, in this, in this participant seminar. Uh, he has participated in Rotary Peace Symposium held at Sao Paulo in Brazil in 2016 and inter, uh, intercountry meet on peace building at Santiniketan, India. So uh, Luis, uh, that's uh, very nice to uh, say once again to be here. Now, you, I, I just asked you about the post retirement and you said, uh, that's what you are going to share. So um, I just want to, want to really waiting for it, for you to share us, what are you doing post retirement in terms of peace? First thing is that as a policeman, uh, you are a peacekeeper, yes? Uh, no. But the role from peacekeeping to peace building, I'm sure there is a there is a difference. You know, peacekeepers are can be can be also with a stick and gun, and also can be the peacekeepers. But peace builders are must be must be very psych, part of it is physical part of it, psychological part of it, counseling and a lot of things happen. So what what exactly you are now engaged in, in the peace building process? Please, Luis, over to you. Thank you. And namaskar to everyone and peace to all. Peace to all. Friends, uh, for me in particular, it's always a very humbling experience. Uh, every time I'm called by Rotary uh, to be part of uh, Rotary endeavors, such as this one. But first, I would like to thank RID 30 to 40 for having made it possible for us, peace scholars and Rotarians, to come together on this interactive platform, to listen to one another and to learn from each other and going forward, hopefully, to work more together towards building a sustainable culture of peace. I'm very happy to tell you that Rotary has been very kind to have given me a number of opportunities to be part of various Rotary programs around the country and abroad. The latest being invited to speak as a panelist in Rotary Centennial Celebrations held at Kolkata last year. In fact, without Rotary's sponsored course on international peace and conflict resolutions undergone at Chula, Chulalongkorn University, Bangkok in 2012, I wouldn't be where I am today. Now coming uh, to the question you just asked, since my retirement in March this year as DIG uh, Assam, uh, I have been very fortunate to be re-engaged as the deputy interlocutor, which enables me to work with non-state armed actors Generally, we call them as uh, militants, extremists, or things like that, insurgents, in terms of their dialogue with the government and in the area of their rehabilitation and reintegration back to society. Uh, my peace, uh, co peace fellows uh, present here will remember that in Chula, there was a pretty long session on DDR. DDR is basically disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Needless to say, uh, that session in particular has come in very handy insofar as my present assignment is concerned. But you may wonder as to whether there are militants at all in this part of the country as no shootouts no ID explosions, no kidnappings for ransom 
and letters up for extortion are uh, taking place for quite some time now. There are actually uh, a number of reasons uh, why the state of Assam has witnessed the longest phase of peace in decades. All credit actually to the successive governments that have shown enough goodwill and have been doing what is necessary to usher in an era of peace, stability, and development in the region. And I feel greatly honored to have been asked to be part of that endeavor to contribute not only as an interlocutor, but also as a peace scholar. One big reason why I was considered for that position was primarily because of the course I underwent in Chula. Thank you again, Rotary. Uh, let me now give you an impression of what Didier looks like with the help of his slide. Uh, could somebody please uh, put up the slide? Yeah, just a moment. So as you can see uh, in the slide, this is the only slide that I have right on top is the former chief minister, uh, Sri Sarvananda Sonowal, presently a cabinet minister in the, with the government of India, attending a huge arms laying down ceremony by militants this very year. And just next to it, you see the present chief minister, Honorable uh, Himanta Biswakarma, inaugurating skill development training program for ex-combatants. And this is where I also part play a role. And this is basically, in short, what DDR is all about. So ladies and gentlemen, this slide could be giving you an impression that all is well here in this part of the country. But let me tell you, not quite, not yet much need to be done still, because a total of 19 militant outfits in the state of Assam have been on ceasefire with the uh, agreement with the government. And which is the reason why you don't hear that many gunshots or explosions, but there are no guarantees here. Because these guys could go back to the jungle any day they think uh, their concerns are being not taken care of. And this is why the third aspect of DDR, which is rehabilitation of these combatants, need to be taken into account with greater urgency. Good news, however, is uh, that out of these five organizations, including the feared India the National Democratic Front of Bodoland, which alone has a cadre strength of more than 11,000, recently signed a MOS, which is Memorandum of Settlement with the government. And that's one reason you don't see that many, uh, that much of violence in Assam now. And this is a huge step towards peace building in this entire region. That means uh, there are at least 14 other outfits, which uh, also can be channel similarly towards uh, what is called in peace parlance, positive peace. And it is exactly here I am involved. And it is here probably Rotary with its uh, global reach can partner with the stakeholders, particularly in the area of skilling up these cadres to make them economically uh, empowered so they can earn their life. And this way, Rotary can help in paving the way to peace, stability, and sustainability, uh, not only in this part of the country, but in fact, the entire world. Thank you.
on to to have what is happening today you know uh, laying down of arms the skill program rehabilitation of that but the question still remains that you know uh, how are the employability you know as uh, uh, guman was mentioning that that employment uh, has to be there to be ready for employment so skill program yes but employment uh, is a question still today and that could be very big challenge for for peace builders and the people who are like you who are really involved into that so i'm sure that will be taken care in the due course and there will be tie up there uh, i understand that there will be some uh, measures have been taken by giving them some small capital to start their enterprises and all uh, but then small enterprises in peace in assam is again a big challenge when it goes through the bureaucratic process of it so uh, there are many challenges still there i'm sure there will be people who would like to know uh, like to understand a little better about that thank you luis thank you for very kindly be with us uh, we will be uh, we will have one more guest with us and then we can go for the open session uh, and already, already the questions are coming up here so thank you so much luis and uh, let me just uh, share with you that uh, the institute of economics and peace which is a knowledge partner of rotary international has released the global peace index 2021 and according to the parameters they used for the study uh, which may be debatable but then that is what does they are used parameters that they feel that the world is considerably less peaceful now than it was in 2008 that was in 13 years the world has become less and less peaceful although all, so many efforts are happening across the globe the 2021 uh, gross uh, global peace index also reveals that world has got a new wave of tension and uncertainty as a result of covid pandemic these tensions have got and resulting to many major powers you know the full impact of course is yet to unravel and is still unfolding so hopefully it doesn't really go very major peace proper problems and all the as per the study the europe remains the most peaceful region in the world Uh, and Middle East and North Africa region remain the world least peaceful region. We are very lucky that we have somebody right from one of the most peaceful, disturbed region today in the world that is from Nigeria, from the North America, North Africa, from Nigeria. So I would invite uh, Dixon Gwe. Uh, can Dixon are you there? Can you join us? Yes, I think he needs to unmute himself. Yeah. Uh, hello. Oh. Hello. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much. Um, yeah. Just a few words about uh, yeah. uh, Dixon for the people to to know you. Uh, he is a direct. He is a doctor in criminology and development studies in National Open University in Nigeria. Uh, he is a Rotary Peace Scholar. The same batch uh, with others today. He is accredited with several published articles uh, to his credit. Uh, he has covered large canvas. ranging from electoral violence social conflict security and peace building militancy in nigeria urban violence legitimation of violence climate variation induced migration uh, land conflicts and security situation foreign policy autocratic governance globalization entrepreneurship icd development and many other relevant topics i was got amazed to see the list of articles that you have are given to you in your credit is a is a wide wide canvas uh, starting from Uh, the electoral violence to the globalization to the ICT, the development of Nigeria. Now you must be thinking a lot about so many aspects of it. You know, so uh, I understand your uh, you have done your thesis on on identity crisis as a major cause of conflict. Now this is something which very very relevant to all of us uh, because in this particular region that has been mentioned by the keynote speaker also and also the Louis just now was mentioning. that there are a lot of identity conflicts are there you know so uh, i mean uh, there are a lot of doubt about who is what who is citizen who is not citizen and then how do you deal with it and all kind of thing you know uh, the ethnic problem and the tribal non tribal kind of thing you know all, all those issues are there in this region quite predominantly so uh, tell us about something more about what what is your your uh, what do you call post relation in your thesis Uh, on the on this identity crisis as a major cause of conflict over to you dixon oh, thank you so much um like uh, you, you 
been told already, uh, a peace fellow and the alumnus uh, who uh, finished with others at uh, Chulalongkorn University, Bangkok. And um, I tell you, uh, since ever we finished uh, the, the professional development program there on peace and conflict resolution, my life and career had not remained the same. In fact, one of the very critical uh, uh, of that article was uh, the concern I gener that, that generated in me uh, from the conflict uh, leading uh, Northern Thailand. After the, our, our, our visit to that area, I, 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 I resolved into thinking, how does this conflict relate to what we have in Nigeria? And then when I came back, uh, I felt that uh, there is need that I dig deep into that uh, issue of conflict of that nature. And then uh, coincidentally, uh, a community in my own state of Ebony State, you know, called the uh, Ezilo uh, community uh, had been uh, emerged in over eight decade conflicts a decade old conflict, you know, between them, uh, the Aborigine, Ezilo, and then the Eza Ezilo. Eza is another community, another uh, uh, tribe identity entirely that migrated, you know, and settled in Ezilo as a community. And uh, when they got to Ezilo, the, 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 the population grew and then they had, because they are nomadic in nature and also war, uh, uh, they, they, they are warfare in nature also. They, 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 when they get to a place, they want to exercise uh, expansionist uh, ideology. So they, 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 they managed to have an inroad into Ezilo uh, identity. And then the new uh, generation that came after they have settled down, I mean, the Ezars had settled down in Ezilo, uh, were decided to take, a, take up a, an identity called Eza Ezilo, that is Eza in Ezilo, okay? So now this Eza in Ezilo claiming that, look, whatever it is the right of the aborigine Ezilo is also their own right. So, but the Ezilo say, no, it can't be. You are a settler, you are not an indigenous, we are indigenous. And so if you, you are a product of, a, of a settlers, you should remain settlers, irrespective of whether you were born here or not. And that was just the summary of the identity issue that, 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 that had been propelling and fueling the crisis, the conflict. It, it, this protracted conflict had, or, or has gravitated around uh, what I call inclusiveness, inequality, access, and involvement, you know? And uh, what we are here to talk about is global peace, stability, and sust sustainability. You cannot talk about this uh, uh, related concept or social phenomenon without addressing, without uh, seeing how they relate to inclusiveness, involvement, involvement inequality, in denial, and access, particularly access to justice, like uh, my, my colleague Monica uh, posited earlier, you know, that access to justice is very key, you know, in entrenching peace, you know, and stability. So I also lean strongly on the position of our keynote speaker that postulated that, uh, that, that, that the conflict has its positive and negative uh, angle. And so you cannot just uh, uh, write off conflict as, as, in, uh, as a, a negative phenomenon. No, it's just like crime that we deal with. Crime has its, its function, you know, by going by the, the structural functionalist uh, uh, theories. They say that crime, just like for conflict, is functional to the society. Without crime, there will be no sign, nothing to show that the society has got a, a problem. And if there is no conflict, there will be no opportunity to really understand sample opinion and compare notes in terms of differences, because differences is a constant thing in human society. And so if human society is laden with people of diverse opinion, diverse uh, notion and perspectives to issues, then there is need for 
us to allow a bit of conflict to prevail. And it also, because it's only when the, such, such happens that it provides window for mediation, window for reconciliation, window for tolerance. And so I look at it as a, 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 a point where we have to bring in the non-state actors, because actually the non-state actors such as the Rotary Club here has a big role to play. They have a big role to play in the sense that the process of mediation in peace building cannot be complete when if you don't have such hard, large hearts like Rotary. The fact that Rotary people, professionals from all walks of life, and then decide to give them benefit of learning new processes, new methods, is enough display of benevolence that can douse tension, douse misconception and intolerance. And so that we, after nine years now, we are still communicating like uh, my, my colleague, uh, Monica uh, said earlier, we are still learning from each other. It's, it's, it's an it's, it's a, a, you know, illustration of how much such love and uh, large heartedness in, in, in giving out that, 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 that Rotary has been known for uh, can go. So for me, I think that um, the question of inequality, the question of, uh, of uh, uh, access or denial of access, particularly access to justice, access to basic thing, necessities of life can only be tamed if the issue of identity crisis is mitigated. It, is, it can only be mitigated only when we entrench the type of mediation that, know, that, that respects each actor. The, greatest uh, uh, proponents to the conflict. We have to entrench such type of mediation, the mediation that do know and that, ha that, that has uh, a finding a common ground at the center of its uh, processes. So uh, for me, I, I think that sustainability is only when you allow for inclusiveness. If you build peace on the basis of inclusiveness, on the basis of involvement, on the basis of freedom of expression, then that peace will be sustainable. But where the peace is built on who I know, the religion I practice, and then the tribe I come from or ethnicity, you know, it's going to, it will just be a temporary, uh, you know, fragile one that will soon get, get way, give way for, for, for that conflict. So for me, deepening the, the idea of, uh, uh, positive and negative uh, conflict is also very key. Not totally concluding that there is, there is no need for conflict. We must subdue the conflict, uh, uh, the conflict angle. No, you can't. Just like you can erase uh, crime or criminality out of human human existence, so you cannot erase conflict because there no, but no, no, even twins, no, no two, no twins act the same way, okay? They might look alike, but they might not act, they will not act the same way. So the fact remains that we must give room, provide avenue for, for ventilation of differences, for ventilation of, uh, of uh, different uh, perspectives, such way that we can also see the, the, the potential that man has got within him. Because if you don't give man the freedom or the, the liberty to express himself, to self-expression, then it means that I also say that the natural uh, potentiality in him or her is to be missing. And so for me, innovative creativity revolves around giving peace and conflict chance, but making sure that they are regulated in a manner that does not compromise its importance. This is where I stop my, I end my conversation today in, the, in, in the, that, uh, that is drawn from my thesis, which says that uh, in, uh, identity supremacy generate identity crisis, and identity crisis leads to denial and 
and then close windows for access. So until we have fair, give fair, 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 fair importance to both conflict and to peace process, we may not actually have peace uh, uh, building in a sustainable way. So that's uh, the, the summary of my But then I want to say that the, with a global trend of uh, uh, which, which is the global order arising from COVID-19, we can see clearly that uh, instead of uh, uh, the, the world looking towards uh, social, uh, looking towards physical distancing, the world is looking towards social distancing. And I tell you, social distancing is like telling us that conflict is bad and the only peace is needed. If you, are, if you engage social distance, you are saying that the family structure, which is a very important structure in human, in human interaction and in human existence, should be, 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 be dismembered. And once that social structure is dismembered by each control mechanism, you know, uh, uh, being unrecognized, then there's a problem. That problem is will result to generational shift from uh, control regulation, you know, primary regulation to a secondary regulation. And you know, the regulation we have, our social control we have that is more efficacious is the one that you get or uh, that, that your parent gives you it from the family. If you leave the family control mechanism for the secondary, uh, uh, the primary control mechanism from the primary uh, uh, social organization or uh, social to a uh, uh, secondary control mechanism uh, arising from the secondary group like schools, then you are saying that the family orientation students exist. Okay, yes, so uh, it is excellent. I, I think that that good uh, and we will. Hello. We have a lot to do in the area of retention creation that revolves around inclusiveness, revolves around do no harm, revolves around um, giving peace a chance and also conflict a chance. Because from these two phenomena, change is brought about. From this change brought about, creativity on how to resolve this, on how to adopt or, or, or inculcate the change will emanate. And from this change inculcated or adopted innovation, better ways of doing things, better ways of reasoning, better ways of seeing things will evolve. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies, for giving me the opportunity to, 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 to share in this discussion. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you so much. Uh, it was wonderful. It's really wonderful listening to you. And particularly uh, for us uh, coming from this region, we can really relate to what you're saying. I'm sure there will be uh, many, many more questions on this. Uh, please stay with us. Uh, I think I have a few questions to discuss with you, but I would prefer to do it in the open session. So uh, thank you so much uh, to all the participants, uh, uh, Rotary Peace Alumni, for being with us today. Uh, and then uh, I would uh, request now uh, the, for an open session. So uh, anybody who would like to ask questions can ask it. Uh, but let me start with some of the questions which are already in the chat box. Uh, here's a question to Umer. Uh, he, are you there, Umer? Yes, I was mu muted. Yes, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So uh, the question is from uh, Rotarian Budin Bhattakur. A uh, member of my, my club, on the same club we belong to. Uh, his question is that after so many, despite so many initiatives taken by the government and NGOs at levels, corporate and private sector organizations are not in favor of appointing specially able skilled people in their offices. Now, how do you motivate the corporate and private entrepreneurs to engage this, uh, this specially able skilled people who for their jobs. Am I clear with the question? Yes, I, I think so. I think that that is a challenge overall that in terms of the inclusion 
uh, of corporations and organization of people who have an impairment. Um, however, what we do, we work on different levels. We, we start their apprenticeship with the end in mind, with their integration into the first labor market. And also the, 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 the you might recall the slide where I said what we do, we build the future skilled experts and strengthen the, the workplace of Switzerland. So we don't mention anything in terms of like having participants who have a certain impairment. And we don't think in deficiencies, we think in resources they have available. The other thing is that we do, and that is a very important component towards the end of their apprenticeship. We do, we run different workshops with them on how to prepare to apply uh, you know, for, for jobs and so on. So that means also to, to uh, work with them, to go with them through interviews and also making sure that we get feedback from the different HR personnel to see how well they did. And this has also helped to, to have to lend jobs for them as well, to prepare them how to apply to jobs and also to support them in identified uh, organizations as well. When they do our apprenticeship, one of our goals is also, and that's the reason why we need to have a strong network with different companies that they can do part for the last few years of their apprenticeship already in organizations. So that is also helping to get to be, for them to be exposed uh, in the first labor market as well. So there are different uh, measurements uh, for, for us to, to address that. However, it also needs a, a certain education uh, of the corporate and inclusion is an overall topic uh, still even here in Switzerland. Thank you, uh, thank you, Umit, uh, Umit. and uh, Budin. I hope uh, you got your answer. Uh, in fact, uh, I was just mentioned thinking that if I had known you earlier, then a uh, few years back I was in Switzerland and then had quite a few days in my hand. I would definitely be very, very proud and very interested to be to visit your centers and all to learn. There is still the, the future answer. for you, and you're welcome. It's an open yeah. so, uh, invitation. So maybe, maybe next. Time if I had the opportunity to visit uh, again your country, your beautiful country. So uh, I'm sure I look for you, look forward to meet you all. Thank you so much, uh, Omer, to be with us. Anybody else has got any questions hey. to Omer Govan? Anybody has got any any questions to Omer Govan? Okay. You can unmute your mic if you would like to ask. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we move on to Luis. Uh, Luis, uh, there's a, there again, like question from Budin. Uh, it, he says that it is observed that, uh, Luis, are you there? Luis? Yeah, yeah I'm there. Okay, I'm thank, here. You. thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Uh, it, it, there's, a, there's an observation from Budin. Uh, it says, uh, he says, it is observed that children of former combatants are somehow not being treated in usual manner in their schools and other social institutions. I personally feel this attitude of our society is not good for sustainable peace in the long run. Please share your ex valuable experience, opinion on this. The, he is talking about the children of the uh, surrendered militants and all, as you, or combatants as you call them. Uh, they are not very well ex accepted in the society. And that's my personal experience also, whatever little I saw and interacted with the, with the surrendered uh, uh, combatants earlier. Uh, I also saw that they have got a very strong feeling uh, against the society that they, because they have, they feel that some, some of the society members uh, believe that they have also done wrong to the community, to the society in their actions. Uh, but then, so they are not really accepted in their own villages also. So what do you have to say about that? Uh, that's very grave, serious question. Uh, it's a fact. Now, how do we go about it? One is to say that, like we said, like conflict is a part of human development, uh, just like the keynote speaker said, quoting probably Johan Galto. Uh, just like, you know what, we don't score 100 marks in all subjects. Um, so there are gray areas. So what do we do? We work on gray areas. Now, as a police officer till the other day, my job primarily was to look 
uh, into what is called the negative uh, piece. So what does it mean by negative piece is not really negative. Negative piece is basically um, in simple words, putting an end to direct hostilities, which means we, the law enforcing agencies uh, do what we do to quell that violence. And now, as you see in the region, you hardly hear some boom blasts and some shootouts. Uh, there are stray incidents, like it recently happened in Shillong and probably in Guwahati too. But those are the gray areas we work on. The same case with the children of the former combatants. Now, their parents were once upon, uh, you may call them extortionists, you may call them extremists. Uh, naturally, people felt a, a, a fell a victim to all these people. Now, how do we go about it? That is where positive peace comes in. That's where Rotary and uh, people like us, people who are in service, need to work together. That's where Yes. On peace scholars working together with Rotary and vice versa, which is not happening. So okay. as a policeman, am I really uh, is it my core competent area work in the area of what you just mentioned? Not really, but together we definitely can. Thank you so much, Luis. Thank you, thank you for a wonderful suggestion. In fact, uh, this this uh, brings us uh, to a suggestion from Monica when she was mentioning about uh, 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 forgiveness, uh, about apologies, uh, which can which which we have seen even. Uh, so South Africa issues also a number of times that these apologies and this forgiveness made a wonderful breakthrough in the peace process. So maybe we can build up something, uh, Rotary and the peace scholars. We have a number of peace scholars around in Guwahati. Maybe we can select some villages, maybe some, some place locations where we can do it. Definitely we can do it. Uh, Louis, thank you so much. We we'll look forward to your support in such. In, and then I would request Puvali to take an initiative as the chairman of the peace committee this year, that maybe some initiative can be started in some, some, some locations in Assam uh, mm -hmm. where, where this can be experimented with. As, as Louis very really correctly said that you don't get 100% success in any effort. And at the same time, as Dixon said, the conflict would remain and it should remain in a society for, for society to, to grow, society to find out and, re and discover itself uh, the community and the society, the, the conflict should remain, and otherwise there will be no creativity in the community. And uh, here to Dixon, uh, here again, coming from Budin, uh, it says that uh, in our region, more than 150 communities have been living from prehistoric period. It is observed that if we try to satisfy one community, others start feeling identity crisis. Being an experienced social in addressing a uh, scholar, in addressing identity crisis in society, can you suggest some idea how to handle this situation, reduce conflict? Now, I just want to add something to this, uh, to Rickson, when you said that inclusiveness could be the answer. And uh, my submission is that you now inclusiveness also uh, generate a fear, uh, fear of loss of identity, fear of loss of culture among the community. And then the big question, like who is who is the original, who is a who is who is uh, the uh, settlers? No, those conflicts are continue, and maybe they continue. But how do you go about it to remove that identity crisis, the fear of it? You know that is very very strong. That uh, that if I if I call if I get consolidated with others, if I get assimilate with other, maybe I lose my culture, maybe I lose my identity. As a, as a community, not as an individual. So uh, how, how do you address that? Um, thank you, thank you so much. Now, I, I want to take it from the point of nationalism and, and being a, a, a nation, you know, for a state to claim a, to claim a nation, being a nation, 
you the state should be able to express identity. I mean, the, the, sorry, the citizens of that of that state should express first identity as a nation before your primary identity. So in the state operational definition of inclusiveness should be that anywhere a child is born becomes his automatic origin. Because if you go to say, because your father or mother migrated, you are simply not addressing the case concerning the child born in that area. You are rather addressing retrogressively the issue of their parents' migration. We shouldn't also be a fact with the offspring of that migration in that new area. So if the state can move further in defining who a stranger is, <coughs> who a, an indigenous is, who, is, who a settler is in this constitution, it will go a long way to, be, to, to reduce conflict arising from supremacy, uh, identity supremacy, sorry, and also identity crisis. Thank you I so much. No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Tilaka, ah. there is one question which has come in the chat box also. I think we can take that. Uh, this yeah. One from Mr. Jude from Jude, India. Uh, yes, yeah. who's asking yeah. what about peace with the environment, forest, the biodiversity, air, water, etc. Peace between people to people, between races. Nations are important and a must. Is Rotary International doing anything on this? So any panelist may answer. Yeah, it's an open, open question, open, open question. question. Yeah. Hmm. Anybody anybody can take it. May I tell the yes. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm going to answer this question. Yeah, please. And, please. Uh, uh, I had the experience of working with Peace Colors of 3240 for the last five years. And from that little I have learned from that. First of all, if we talk about this environment and forest, now Rotary International has already added its a seventh area of focus. That means Rotary International is going to do a lot many works on environment. And the environment is directly related to biodiversity, AR, water ability. So we are now planning to work for uh, environment like uh, rehabilitation of river, uh, keeping these hills and others intact. We are already in the process of working on it. So many global, global grants has been designed for this. And uh, hopefully within next few years, we'll be able to prominently do this type of works. Okay. And uh, peace between people to people, between uh, races and nations are important and must. Rotary is doing excellent works on this area for the last many decades. And we are somehow successful on it. And if you, if someone like to know in detail, may visit uh, our grant uh, system. That means from Rotary Foundation, we are managing grants. So we have, uh, <coughs> we have done so many projects on it uh, globally. Even in India, we did many uh, these type of projects. And uh, this is still continuing and uh, we are committed to do this. I think I'm 
I think I'm uh, clear on my point. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you are right there. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question to our uh, keynote speaker? Of course, of course, of course. Yeah. If he's there. Can you check? I'm not sure. I, I'll, I'll just check. Uh, Dr. Nanakumal Mantha, uh, are you there? I think not. I think he's not here. I think, I think he's not here. Yeah. I'm sorry, Manash. Okay. I have a question, if I may be allowed. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Let, let me finish, then uh, somebody else can come. Yeah, yeah, please. I have another question. I am directing it to uh, Monica. Well, Monica, Monica, hang on. Monica, uh, Monica, has Monica is, up, is just. She has left. She has left. Oh, has left. okay, okay. Then I have no question. Okay. It's all right. You can pass it on to next one. Yeah. Anyone next? Anybody want to come in? Uh, I have a question, if I may be allowed. Yeah, yeah. Please, please go ahead. My question is to Sir Omar. Omar, okay. Okay. Sir, my question yes. is with regards, uh, regards to spreading peace amongst the youth of the different nations. If that is taken into account, what do student exchange program this? Is there any kind of a policy or pact that helps protect this peace? Because there are many times we see that the youth, when they visit nations or different countries, they do undergo some kind of, I would not call the word racism, but some kind of unpleasantness. How do you think this peace conflict resolution would add to such, uh, you know, um, security of the students undergoing student exchange programs? I'm not a hundred percent sure I fully understood the question. Um, in terms of that, there was a bit of interruption. Can you perhaps rephrase it again, quickly? Am I audible now? Hello. Yes. Yes, you are. You, you are. Oh, yes. You are. My question yes. is: Do student exchange programs, where we are talking here about peace and peace resolution and conflict, do you think that in these peace and resolution conflict, we should even give attention to youth where they go for student exchange programs. What are the things that they should be knowing that would help them to safeguard the peace and, you know, have a better, uh, like in terms of Rotary, Rotary gives, uh, you know, um, togetherness. Mm -hmm. So that type of togetherness, is it to be advocated in other locations as well, using Rotary as a platform? Yes, I think definitely Rotary has a platform and I'm not quite sure what kind of programs exist, but however, I know through the program that I attended, I mean, one of my biggest advisor in general is my daughter, you know, in terms of like uh, what she thinks and, and what, what should be done and, and so on. So uh, I don't have too much experience in that sense of what kind of programs Rotary has, but I think definitely has, has to have a role. And I also see it here with the work I'm doing here um, because I'm in contact with uh, Save the Children in Sweden, for example, to to export, uh, not to export, but to see what can be applied from what we do here in different countries, but also learning from different countries as well. There's an organization uh, that works in Latin America and they also do similar programs, so we can also learn from them. Uh, so I definitely think, I strongly believe that we need to enable that the youth in terms of peace uh, and also to listen to them because they, they they are smart. They question the right things and they put us, even including myself, my daughter, sometimes in the right mindset as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll take one more question uh, before we close it. Uh, can I ask this question to uh, Luis? Yeah, yeah, please, please. Nani is not there, so I forgot yeah. that uh, we have a scholar from uh, Northeast. Uh, Luis, if you're uh, there, I have a small question, uh, which is uh, bothering me a bit. Um, you come from an area where uh, we have an endemic uh, reasons or conflicts of various kinds. It could be ethnic, it could be religious, it could be linguistic, it could be anything. Uh, the question is that you as a peace scholar, uh, how, how do you see the role of the political class? Because as I see that uh, uh, 
politically vested interests engineer or aggravate the situation for their political ends. A lot of our troubles are because of the political brazenness that we defy law, we define the social niceties, and we want to achieve our political goals by all means. Now, in that kind of a context, as a peace scholar, how do you uh, sort of uh, approach the political class? Or is there any approach? Is there any way you can approach? Maybe you are alone and you can't do much. But is there any way we can do collectively with all the rest of the uh, rest of the peace scholars? Thank you. All Thank you for that question. Region and outside as well. Can we do a collective job? How do you view it? Uh, I suppose that's that, that's a very good question. First of all, thank you for that. I think that's what we need to do. That's what I uh, tried to say right uh, at the end, that we need to work together more than we've been doing. Now, the question of whether some political uh, figures or classes or parties, whether they uh, kind of instigate and kind of, you know, uh, escalate the issues that are already there, that may be true to some extent. But as of, as, so far as the government of Assam is concerned, and in terms of uh, containing or resolving the issues emanating out of uh, extremism, or you may call it insurgency, I think government has been very, very positive here. Now, there are areas like Budin or authoritarian Budin had uh, just mentioned in terms of the children. Uh, there are gray areas we need to be sorted out. But if you see the bigger picture, as they say it, what is the bigger picture? Bigger picture is there's been a long spell of peace. Now there'll be people, uh, they could be politicians, they could be anybody, uh, who would be wanting certain types of uh, conflicts to carry on, to conflicts to in, in fact escalate because they benefit from it. And in fact, uh, if you see it um, from the point of view of even peace studies, you know, it's the conflict uh, which we thrive on. If you look at it from a particular angle, like just because there is a thief, you know, I get my job. Now, the thing is, as the police have said, do I want the thief to continue doing that? Yeah, well, there'll be a couple of guys who may be wanting to do that. So our job is primarily to work together to keep things at a manageable level. And that's what, that's, I suppose, is good enough in terms of building uh, peace in, in our society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louis. Uh, thank you so much for giving that, giving some perspective to this whole issue. You know, uh, thank you. Manasha, I hope you have got the answer. And then, yes, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it is, uh, as they say, peace is not something you wish for. You, know, you have to work for it. Uh, everybody needs to come together and work for it and something to give, something to give away uh, to get the peace. So that is how the peace is made. Now, uh, thank you once again. Thank you all the, all the peace scholars uh, for joining us. Uh, Monica has left already, but to kindly stay on. Uh, there is a recognition to be given uh, to all the participants today. Uh, thank you for coming up. I request uh, Bhuvali to take the book, please. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Rotarian Thila, for moderating this session. And thank you to all the Peace Fellows for participating and for sharing your views and your the area of your activities as a Peace Scholar that you have been doing. Thank you so much. Now, uh, I would like to request Rotarian uh, Dr. Vincent Darlong to just give a short summing up of this session. Thank you, good evening. We are pretty late. Mm -hmm. Our number has reduced from 53 to 23. <laughs> well, I think this is the most difficult part of the session, you know, after such a scholarly discourse by our keynote speaker and the four illustrious peace scholars, it's very, very challenging to say in a few words what we have achieved this evening. Anyway, 
Starting with our keynote speaker, Professor Nani Gupal Mahanta. He took us to the aspect of how to approach conflict resolution and peace process. He also spoke about how post-COVID is going to affect global peace and stability. And he emphasized on the possible role and responsibilities of Rotary Peace Scholars you know, in contributing to peace in their respective areas. Well, he spoke very many things, but I think two messages that I'd like to share is basically, he says that we should not look conflict as a negative, you know, as negative things necessarily. Conflict could bring peace. He gave the example of Bodo experience in which he says several, several years of conflict has brought peace today. But the process is a time taking. It requires enduring patience, continuous engagement with the communities, and of course, the role of civil society organizations, which is a critical aspect in achieving that peace. And he sum up his own role as a Rotary Peace Scholar, how he is contributing to his knowledge by building a new center for conflict and peace resolution, a conflict resolution and peace center. And how he, has, he is trying to actually put his learning into practice for the greater good of the society. In a short period, we have been able to visit four countries or continents, India, Africa, Switzerland, and USA. We have heard Mr. Omer from Switzerland talking about his own experience with people who are with some impairment, especially psychological impairment and physical impairment. He talked about keeping people in the center, those who are their target groups. He talked about education, importance of education that could help in bringing peace and that could lead, education can lead to gainful employment and that can maintain peace. I think this is the summing up of the story that he has shared with us and wonderful work that he and his center is doing. And going to USA, Monica spoke about you know, importance of mediation, which can help in resolving dispute. She talked about how even the current situations of pandemic through digital process, you know, lots of negotiation and mediation can take place, thereby reducing the cost, preventing the, you know, long legal battle in the court, or even reducing expenditure. She spoke basically emphasizing the skill in mediation is an important dimension in promoting peace and reducing conflict or resolving conflict. Of course, she was the third speaker, but Louis Ayan in India spoke about the role of DDR, you know, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration in peace building. He spoke about the role that he had been able to play in bringing in terms of peace and especially reducing violence and returning peace, you know, and rehabilitation as an important aspect of maintaining peace in the society. Our last speaker, Dr. Dixon, spoke about identity crisis that can bring major conflict in the society. He also spoke about how harmless shifting of ground could produce peace. And of course, he emphasized on the involvement of non-state peace building actors, such as the Rotary Club and other NGOs. He talked about the need 
to allow diverse opinion to be brought forward so that ultimately you know reconciliation can be achieved and i think many of these you know issues are based on their practical experiences but finally he also spoke about current social distancing situation that could also lead to some kind of conflict in some communities because of this pandemic situations now i must admit that in between i had my own you know digital conflict and digital pandemic because many of the speakers i couldn't get clearly but summing up from the rotary's perspective today what we need is mainly peacemakers how do we become peacemakers every rotarian is perhaps challenged to become a peacemaker we have a growing insecurity in our insensitivity to human suffering we need people of compassion violence is a merciless wheel you know it's a long way to peace can our faith in religion or goodness and belief in humanity can bring peace what values can the rotarians promote in building peace can we promote how to win the love and esteem of our enemies or who are not in agreement with us how can we promote self criticism by self corrections how can we bring non violence in our daily life i think some of these values are what the rotarians are trying to achieve finally we have as we have heard in one of the issues brought forward that we also have conflict not just with our fellow human beings but today one of our main concern has to be conflict with nature with the environment we see climate change affecting us reduction degradation of biodiversity affecting all our own existence i think this is where the need for rotarians to be awakened much more not just being what we are doing but also each one of us trying to become peacemakers in the society i'd like to conclude this brief narrations by reading this beautiful beatitude of peacemakers composed by bishop claus from germany it reads like this blessed are those who pay as much attention to the interest and concern of others as to their own they shall foster peace and unity in the society blessed are those who take the first step to meet others they shall discover that the other is much more open than it seemed blessed are those who never lose patience they shall always find a new beginning blessed are those who first listen and only then speak they shall be listened to blessed are those who in discussions always discover first what is right in the contributions of others they shall be able to integrate and medi mediate blessed are those who never use their positions egoistically they shall be met with respect blessed are those who are never offended or disappointed they shall create good climate thank you very much this evening especially the chair of the peace of the district 320 rotary and pubali rotarian telok das and pdgs who are present here and of course above all the star of this evening our peace scholars across the globe wherever they may be you brought us a new dimensions of what is peace what is conflict resolution thank you very much for narrating your own life experiences practicing what you have learned in your society thank you once again thank you thank you rotary and vincent dalong for beautifully summing up the session and giving us the take away of this evening from out of the session thank you once again thank you now 
Rotary District 3240 highly appreciates the participation of all our esteemed speakers and in recognition and acknowledging their valuable contributions to this webinar, we would like to present a certificate of appreciation to them. I request if our AG, Mr. Kishan Tibrawala, if he's still around. Uh, Mr. Tibrawal, yeah, are you there? Uh, Danny, uh, Kishan, can you, can I think Kishan, no, Kishan is not here. Can't see. Okay, and if Manas Dai is still present? Yeah, Kalpana Baidu is here. Oh, and, yes, uh, Kalpana Baidu is also there, so I will request PDZ Kalpana Khan. Ma'am, are you there? Please do the honor and uh, will you just show uh, Kalpana Baidu? Uh, Uh, video is off. By the unmute, by the video to on, oh, uh -huh. by the please honor our guest speakers, yeah. all our keynote speakers and guest speakers by presenting this certificate of appreciation. So, this is going to be shown by Danny. Yes, Danny yes. will show you yeah. a few words from yeah. you. Yeah, it's uh, okay. Um, Good evening, everyone, uh, particularly the chair, uh, Uterian Kubali, past district chair of Inovin, and uh, my colleagues from the Council of Governors. Uh, our esteemed uh, resource persons this evening uh, who have been doing uh, very praiseworthy work uh, in various parts of the world. And uh, we are really proud of the achievements of our uh, Peace Fellows. Uh, I also uh, thank, uh, I extend my appreciation to uh, uh, Rotarian Tilak and uh, uh, Budhin who is here. And uh, on behalf of the organizing committee on behalf of Kubali and the team, I would uh, like uh, Rotarian Denny to kindly uh, put on screen uh, the recognitions for our esteemed speakers this evening. Yes. This certificate of appreciation awarded to Dr. Dixon Ogbonaya Igwe, Peace Scholar Speaker, for his phenomenal and worthy presentation on topic Global Peace, Stability and Sustainability in International Webinar on Peace organized by Rotary International District 3240. This certificate was awarded on 21st September 2021. I'd like to request the speaker kindly accept. It will be sent to you by May. Yes, can we have the next certificate, please? Next yeah, one. It's there. It's there. It's there. It's, uh, yes, same. Certificate of Appreciation awarded to Louis Ayand, Peace Scholar Speaker, for his phenomenal and worthy presentation on topic Global Peace, Stability and Sustainability. Yes, I would also like to mention that uh, Louis was one of the speakers uh, during the centennial celebrations of Rotary in Kolkata last year. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Danny and Kubali. Yes, uh, we have the other. These are all mementos of appreciation. Is uh, past governor Manas here? This is for Mr. Omer Guven. And next one. Oh, I think that's all. Where are my Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, extend our uh, respect and appreciation uh, for this personality who have been present today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would now like to request Rotary and Budin Bhattakur to kindly give the formal vote of thanks. Uh, before going to this uh, formal vote of thanks, I'd like to request uh, our Peace Scholar, uh, Jadav Pego and Bhaskar Pego, those who are from the very beginning till 
uh, this almost nine. May I have uh, them in the screen? Jadav uh, Pegu, please call Jadav Pegu. Yeah, he is here. Yes. Yeah, I'm waiting. Just, uh, uh, just one moment. Hello, good evening, everybody. Yeah, we wanted to see you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, nice to, nice to Thank see you, you so everybody. Much. I was actually traveling. I was in my vehicle. Uh, so I just reached my destination. So uh, you are seeing me uh, in the light. Thank you very much in... for being with us. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. For, yeah. uh, from the very beginning, I am seeing you from the very beginning. You are with us. Yes, yes. Thank I have been uh, trying to hear uh, what uh, I mean. And um, also meet meet up with all my old uh, classmates. That's what uh, yes. I wanted to see them, actually. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Rotarian uh, Budinda, yeah. we have some guests from the Bangkok also who were there right from the beginning. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think the other pig is also there. No, his video is not here. And this video one is from uh, District 3350. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have him on the screen. Uh, hello. Hello, sir. Yeah, we are getting you. But your video is not. Yeah, yeah. fine. Yes. Just to say hello now in Bangkok yes. is. Uh, 1025 already. So um, I'm glad joining this session. It's quite valuable and it's all show that uh, we are uh, a Rotarian uh, committed to peace. Um, just like to uh, thank all of you that uh, dedicate your time and efforts to organizing this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may, may I have the Jada Pegu? Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Burin. Yeah. Actually, my uh, camera is not working. Okay. I, I could unmute myself. But they're liking uh, your voice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much to all the Rotarians today and to my classmates from Chula Long Kong. Uh, so I, I was actually, uh, I was late in joining, but I was actually waiting to participate in this seminar. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to be part of this. Uh, and uh, it was very nice uh, hearing Homer, Monica, Louise, and diction plus and uh, inputs from the Rotarians here, uh, our respected Rotarians. It was very, very, and it was very, very uh, interesting. And it definitely, it, uh, it made me remember all the things that I learned as a Peace scholar. So I thank you again. But Tinda, we Thank have you. had uh, PDG Rotarian David Hilton from District 3080. If Sai so, is still around? I think David has left. He's not there. He's not here. Okay. Anyway, coming to this uh, final part yeah. of this yeah. program, vote of thanks. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, sincerely thanks all our speakers today, starting from Nonigable Monto. To Umar, uh, Dr. Umar, Monica, Dixon, uh, and uh, special thanks goes to for helping us organizing this beautiful seminar. And we'd like to congratulate Pubali for the successful completion of this uh, seminar. Uh, I would like to also I, I would also like to thank uh, Manasda, Tilakda, Danny, Rima, Rotter, and Vivek. Uh, Dr. Vincent and all, all other people here, including PDGs and Rotarians, and the time is going out, so I am not taking special name anyone. So thank you all for making this program successful. Special thanks goes to Kubali, yeah. and hope in near future we'll have another beautiful program very shortly. And thank you, Tilakda. Thank you for accepting our. Thank you. Yeah. I thank everyone thank so. once again. Thanks everyone you. for joining and making it a good success. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. All, all, nice. all the guests Perfect. and invitees, all Rotarians who joined us from abroad, from all over the place. I could see somebody joined from Nepal also. Rotarian chair was from the from Nepal, and someone from Singapore also had joined. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank good you. Night. Good night. Good Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Take care.
Thank you.